Oh, hello. The following episode of In Response was filmed on April 25th, 24 hours after the BNR update was released, stating that there would be no new bands in standard. Josh Lee Kwai and myself, for our first topic, debated whether or not they should have banned Felidar Guardian. I think it was a pretty good debate. 24 hours later, Wizards of the Coast released that, yes, we are banning Felidar Guardian. <laughs> Josh and I had many long discussions over whether or not we should air the debate, and in the end, we decided we'd like you to see it. Even though from our perspective when we filmed it, Felidar Guardian was not yet banned, we think that we raise a lot of good issues as to whether or not it should have been. Also, we have two other exciting and insightful debates to show you with special guests Graham Stark of Loading Ready Run and Nate Holt of Enter the Battlefield. So please, enjoy. Welcome to In Response, the Magic the Gathering debate show where Josh Lee Kwai, myself, and guests debate the hot and pressing issues of Magic the Gathering. We've got a really exciting episode for you this week. We know we've been gone for a while and we're going to try and make it up to you. Josh, tell them a little bit about the surprises we have in store. Well, we have two awesome guests this week. We have Graham Stark from Loading Ready Run and Nate Holt from Enter the Battlefield. And talking about battlefields, they are going to enter the battlefield of debate with you, Professor, and I'm really excited to see how those go. All right, but you're not out of here that easily, Josh, because you and I still have to debate an issue, and I think we are going at the biggest, hottest topic in Magic the Gathering right now, and that is standard bans, or more specifically, the lack of them. The BNR announcement was just yesterday as of the filming of this video, and to everyone's shock and surprise, Felidar Guardian was not banned in standard. Josh, where do you fall on this issue? I think the cat should have been banned, absolutely. What an amazing coincidence because I feel that way as well. So it looks like both of us are going to be arguing the exact same position on the issue. However, that doesn't mean our arguments are going to be the same. I think that you might agree with me on this issue, but you don't quite see it correctly. And so I'm going to try and show you my perspective. What do you say, Josh? It's ironic that even when we agree, we can find ways to disagree. I don't really agree with you on that. But anyway, <laughs> since we're both arguing the same side of this issue, why don't we completely, without any planning here, roll to see who is going to present their argument first. Josh, for presenting first, choose high or low. Uh, I gotta go with high. You gotta go with high. All right, I'm rolling a d20 here. And it was a very low roll. We rolled a five. That means I'll be presenting my argument first. Okay, Prof, at your ready. Felidar Guardian enables a turn four reliable combo in standard. And the biggest problem with this isn't just the fact that combo is in standard, but rather the fact that if decks cannot beat specifically Sahili Cat combo, then those decks simply are going to get washed out of most events, both competitive and at the local game store, which is why we are seeing one of the least diverse standard environments ever. Because the only deck or decks, there's really just one to two of them that are capable of outrunning the cat, uh, are the only ones that are going to make it to day two. And so this is a big problem. But something that we really need to note here is that Felidar Guardian was a mistake. R&D admitted that they were not aware of the combo when they released the card. Now listen, I want to be really clear, mistakes happen. I do not hold R&D to such a, a, a level that they should be infallible. We all make these mistakes, but aren't those what bans are for? I mean, if we're going to ban things like Reflector Mage, can anyone even explain to me why Reflector Mage was banned and yet 
Felidar Guardian was not, this makes no sense. You are sacrificing the success, playability, and enjoyment of your premier constructed format for what? Well, some very good points, Prof, uh, made even more so by the fact that I agree with all of them. Well, I'm really excited to hear your points, Josh, but I can't promise that I'll agree with them, even though I do agree with your ultimate position <laughs> on the issue. It doesn't mean that I agree with how you got there. Why don't you tell me why you think Felidar Guardian needed to be banned in standard? Well, listen, I said this a couple of months ago when we were debating the standard bannings of Emrakul, Smuggler's Copter, and Reflector Mage. I don't like bannings. It's super disrupting to the player base. It kind of feels like wizards took your money and they like lit it on fire. Banning should only be used in the most dire of circumstances. Unfortunately, I think that's right what we're in the middle of right now. But because of poor decisions made back in January and the banning of those three cards, which those three cards were not dire circumstances, by the way. There were three top tier decks in that meta and they were all in contention. But because of that, Wizards is super hesitant to ban a card that is even more oppressive. Now, I was talking to Saffron Olive on Twitter and he showed me a statistic that said that Staheli Cat combo is 46% of the current meta. That's almost half. But Wizards is still scared to ban the card because of the immediate impact on players and the precedent that it sets. So on one hand, I kind of understand why they're, it's tough to ban Cat, but they're not off the hook because it's tough to ban Cat because of poor decisions that you made earlier. And yeah, we don't have a time machine. We can't go back and remake those decisions. But still, given all that, I think it's pretty obvious that the best choice was to just pull the Band-Aid off here, ban Cat, try to get Standard back to a good spot so maybe, maybe people will come back. I mean, word around the campfire is that nobody's playing Standard which actually is an upside if you're gonna ban the cat because you're not affecting that many people. Another upside is that um and Ket's gonna come out and have a big impact if you ban cat because you've basically forced that to happen through these bannings. I know that stuff is not ideal. I'm gonna continue a little bit here. Uh, wait, wait, you're gonna continue, but I, I have to offer, no, I, I, I was gonna offer my perspective on uh, uh, this, not quite a rebuttal, but you're going in an interesting direction. I see what you're saying, Josh, but what you're missing out on here is the big picture. <laughs> okay, tell me the big picture, Prof. 45 seconds, go ahead. The issue here isn't even precedent because that is outrageous. Precedent, this is what bans are for. I can think of no more specific occurrence where a ban is needed than when you literally acknowledge we did not intend for this to happen. Because of course, with things like Emrakul, that card and its power was intended. And they said, okay, it's taking over too much of the meta, so we're going to ban it. But here, this should not have existed. So that is precisely what bans are for. There is no impact financially in banning a 40 cent uncommon. That's all Felidar Guardian costs. So the ultimate question is, is why why are we focusing on this idea of, well, if we use our ability to ban too much, then that's gonna hurt us in the long run. A stale standard is what's hurting you. I think that's important, but I mean, if the mistake that they made didn't break standard, then they wouldn't have to ban it, right? The mistake itself is not the problem. The problem is that it's broken standard. Well, I, I, I'm interested to hear how you uh, explain that those aren't exactly the same thing, Josh. How about you take 45 seconds at your ready? I think the important thing here is actually, it's another is the juice worth the squeeze question, right? Let's say you ban cat. You're really making a weight and measure. And on one side is all the people that are gonna leave the game or stop playing because you killed their deck. And on the other side is the people that are gonna come and start playing standard for the first time or come back because you've opened up the format and made it fresh again by taking out the combo. I think that's really the way that bans should be looked at is, you know, how bad is the thing? And is it pushing us in a negative direction or a positive direction when we ban something? But really, my big point is the underlying decision-making that's happening at Wizards and how unsettling it is that they're flip-flopping back and forth between, listen, in January, they're basically saying, we're gonna be really aggressive with standard bannings. Now they're saying, we gotta be careful. We might be too aggressive with standard bannings. <laughs> yeah, that doesn't make any sense. I mean, they literally said, okay, we can just chat about this for a, a second here at the wrap up, uh, but it, it, it boggles my mind that, and that is the correct pronunciation of boggles, by the way, it boggles my mind that 
Wizards of the Coast would say, we are doing more frequent ban updates. This is for a reason, a need, a necessity. And then at the very first one they do, which is the previous one, no changes. And then the next one, no changes. And now more than ever, there is a huge precedent for there to be a ban in standard. I, I would say that I cannot for the life of me fathom why they felt the need for more frequent ban announcements and then immediately did not ban anything. And, and to do those perplexing ones, like, again, can you even begin to explain to me why Reflector Mage was banned in the first place? Why are they going to say, well, listen, we better get rid of Reflector Mage and then Felidar Guardian, no, nah, it's fine. Yeah, and I absolutely agree with this. And I think that at the time that Reflector Mage got banned, most of us said like, okay, well, I think this is setting uh, the stage for the fact that they're going to look at bannings in a different way than they have in the past. And if that's true, then Felidar Guardian should be banned now, right? It, it's just, it's very perplexing to me and it's, it's boggling to me that... Our, fr our friend Wedge at the Mana Source tweeted out, no, it shouldn't be banned now. It should have been banned at the prior BNR update, the, the first one. And, and what a great, actually, talk about a great justification of their new schedule of frequent updates for them to say, listen, we're doing our first sooner than normal, m more often than normal, I should say, be in our update. And you know what we're hitting? We're hitting this uncommon card. It was a mistake. You know, we, we're human. It happens. And I really want to stress, by the way, if I didn't already, that I think it's very unfair to get angry at R&D for a, an error like this, because these things happen. But what do you do when you make a mistake? Do you just like continue on just plodding through and plodding through? Or do you say, we need to fix this? We understand it, we're in agreement. It seems like we all agree on the fact that Guardian is a problem, it was not intended. I, I, I don't understand. And it, I, I think it's a huge error on their part. To me, the decision-making process over there is what's suspect. They have been so quick to pull the levers and turn the knobs so often with the rotation schedules and now the banning philosophy and then the change to that philosophy, or, or at least it appears so, I mean, have a plan, stick to it, see if it works. That's all I want. So that we can in some way predict what's going to happen. But sending these mixed signals, and it just feels like panic. It just so often feels like panic. And that's what's it, it a little bit scary to me. It is panic because like you said, word on the street is standard attendance is dropping like a rock. People are freaking out. People don't want to play standard. It, it, it Viewership's down, attendance is down. Uh, uh, we can't prove this. We don't have the numbers, but you know we all have our our friend at Star City Games or Channel Fireball or just the local game store. You know we can make a reasonable guess, and if they are acting panicked, that would probably be a really good reason as to why. What was the last standard environment that was really you felt? the feeling of the opposite of just growth and excitement. I would say Khan's Atarkir block is when I last felt it. It was before they changed to the 18 month rotation. And I think honestly, you can make a lot of statements about a lot of things, but that change right there was the big one that started uh, everything rolling in the wrong direction. And the well, problem they is changed they've changed back. It. They changed back. Hey, here's a here's The problem is they changed it you. back, right? But they haven't waited to see if that will have any effect. They did six other things at the same time. And so that scientifically is just a bad way to go about it because now when it changes, you don't know why. Right, right, right. Or if it doesn't change, maybe the other things you did caused a problem that is negating the positive effect of going back to uh, the rotation. But they didn't just change to the rotation. They got rid of core sets and they got rid of the three block uh, three uh, 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 set block structure. So my next question to you is just real quick. We're not, let's not do the debate on it, but just yes or no. Josh Lee Kwai, should we bring back core sets? I love core sets. I didn't want jo them to go. Yes away or in the no, first place. Josh Lee Kwai. Should we go back to three sets in uh, uh, three sets per block? That I'm less sure of. I think I'm sort of 50 50 either way on that. But uh, core sets, I definitely miss. And the most important question, Josh Lee Kwai, Leovold, banned in commander. Should that have <laughs> happened? I don't like anything banned in Commander. I want to unban things. Are, 
Are you insane? Leovold was the most oppressive, miserable. Co can you name he for me? He wasn't even the top one tier commander. commander. Zur right the Enchanter right now, right is, now, no, no, is no, no. a stronger right deck. Right now, I want you to name for me one commander that is more miserable to play against than Leovold that's legal. Derevi can be. That stacks decks can be can be very, very strong. I also think things like Zur that just beat you on turn four. I mean, that's not fun. That's fair. Zur should pro Yeah, you're right. We're going down the slippery slope. All right, all right. We'll, we we got to save some of these for future episodes. <laughs> Josh, why don't you tell us about our first guest? All right. So our first guest is going to be Nathan Holt from Enter the Battlefield. Come on in, Nate. Thank you so much, Josh. I'm so happy to be here. And I'm very excited to debate with the professor today the question. Is Wizards of the Coast printing too many supplemental products? I say no. Bring it on. The amount of products that Wizards of the Coast is releasing for Magic the Gathering is hitting a critically high point, and what I believe we are seeing is something called oversaturation. Namely, there's just too much being put out on the market, too much to buy. It used to be that the only things there were were booster packs and starter decks. Then starter decks gave way to theme decks. Theme decks were uh, joined by event decks, and before you knew it, we had premium decks, clash packs, five commander products a year, anthologies, summer sets such as the master's sets and on and on and on. I literally cannot list all the different products that were put out in 2016 by Wizards of the Coast because that would eat up all of my time. This is too much, and the reason why it's a bad thing is simply that players can't keep up and it can affect player interest in the game. If every couple of weeks there's a new thing to get overly excited about, that excitement has a finite limit, and players are going to find themselves disinterested and apathetic towards each new product as time goes on. You just can't keep up with it all, let alone keeping up financially. When so many of these supplemental products include things like needed reprints here and there, or hard to get cards, things that should be going into the main block sets, but now are being sold separately, then consumers have an expectation of buying these products. We only have so much money. All right, Nate, you are going to be arguing not only is Wizards of the Coast not making too many products, but you feel they're not making enough. I'm really curious to hear what you have to say. 90 seconds. So should Baskin Robbins make only four types of ice cream? Or is the whole 31 thing working out for them? How could there be too many types of magic products? The more the better. It's a collectible game. There are tens of thousands of cards. You pick whatever ones you want to play with to personalize your style, and magic products work the same way. When I want to teach my 12-year-old nephew how to play magic, I want to give him as many choices as possible. If he wants to play in a clash pack, then let's play a clash pack. He wants to play Intradex? Fine by me. We want to spread magic to as many different people as possible, and more flavors is better. You mentioned reprints. Very important. It's not cool for you to have toys that I can't have. So we gotta reprint a lot of cards to make them affordable for the customer. And the way you reprint a Mythic Rare in Modern Masters with a $10 booster pack is different than the way you reprint a, a legacy sideboard card such as Stifle in a $4 pack of Conspiracy. There are different needs for quantitative easing and having a lot of different supplemental products really helps along those lines. Now, nobody is forcing you to buy any of these products. Why do we have to keep up? Who cares which unsold cards are sitting on a shelf in Walmart. I'm going to buy the products I like, you buy the ones you like, and I'm not going to tell you that you can't have your supplemental products and I have mine. There's enough cardboard in the world for every to, everybody to have uh, as many products as they like. So uh, more is not better. Watsy isn't going to sell things that don't sell. They're going to cancel event decks and keep the supplemental products that do work. All right, Prof, I gave you a lot to work with. Now I'm excited to see what you do with 45 seconds of rebuttal. Whenever a new product comes out, it's hype. But if we're always living in a state of hype, then we are never living in a state of hype. We are going to become desensitized to it eventually if we have not already. Who cares about unsold cardboard on the shelves of stores? Wizards of the Coast cares because that's lost money. And we the players should care too because if the company is losing money, then our favorite game may not be around forever. The fact that we need a $4 reprint of Stifle for Legacy is not 
not going to be the reason that we have to have this many supplemental products. I am not calling for an end of all supplemental products, but I am saying that this has been a record high and it's too many. All right, Nate, the last word is yours. 45 seconds. I'll acknowledge that there are marketing challenges with having so much hype around so many supplemental sets. However, when I see magic cards spoiled on the Magic the Gathering Facebook page, there's a whole lot of likes. People love looking at pictures of brand new magic cards. They just jam the like button and they hit their pre-order. And guess what? Magic is selling more cards and having more success than ever before. And you know what? If a supplemental product doesn't sell, Fine, let it die. Event decks. I bought one. They're not there anymore. Do I care? No, because there's all these other awesome supplemental sets that I can buy. So there's nothing wrong with having a lot of supplemental sets. The market will decide which ones stay and which ones go. And I say, that's fine. We trust wizards to do their thing. All right, that's time. Uh, we certainly can't accuse you of not being enthusiastic for this game. Thank you so much, Professor. Thanks, Nate, for coming on. It was very much a pleasure and some great points made. Now I'm actually gonna throw it to a second guest. We have Graham Stark from Loading Ready Run coming on to tangle with you, Professor. Thank you, Josh, and thank you, Prof, for having me on. Our topic is Channel Fireball will be the exclusive tournament organizer for all GPs starting in 2018, and whether or not that is a good thing. I'm arguing in favor that it is a good thing, and Prof thinks that perhaps it is not. Take it away, Prof. All right, thank you, Graham, and it's a real pleasure to be here. I want to begin by saying that I am in no way criticizing or attacking Channel Fireball as a business. My argument is against the idea of any business, be it Channel Fireball, be it Cascade Games, be it Card Kingdom or Star City Games, having such exclusivity over GPs and many downsides to that that I see. I'm a big fan of Channel Fireball. In fact, they're flying me out to GP Vegas because they want me to put on a panel there to make that a special event. But the problem with anybody having such exclusivity comes down to two major issues, lack of incentive and lack of innovation. Let's start with the idea of lack of incentive. Lack of incentive means why should we strive to offer the best prices available or the best prize support available when we are the only company here? There is no competition and therefore there is no incentive. If other companies are offering uh, competing GPs, then you can't just say, well, our GP is going to cost $200 when everyone else is charging $60. But when you are able to set the standard of pricing or prize support, then we have a potential problem because you're going to want to charge as much as possible. You're a business after all and offer as less as possible. Also, what about the idea of innovation? I mentioned that Channel Fireball is flying me out to GP Vegas. What a great idea, Channel Fireball, but they had that idea and other companies did not. What if one of the other companies this year was the exclusive provider of GPs? We wouldn't have such new ideas. What is going to be missed in 2018. All right, Professor, fair points, thanks. All right, Graham, but you're in favor of this, and I'm really interested to hear what you think the positive or upsides to Channel Fireball having this exclusive deal are. You have 90 seconds, and you can begin whenever you're ready. Thank you, Prof. So the notion of a monopoly is what I object to the most, because apart from anything else, Wizards is the one that has the monopoly on GPs. Channel Fireball is going to be running the tournaments. Now, you say that they'll be able to jack the prices up, as they would, because they're a business. But they're also a smart business, and a business that relies on one resource more than any other, which is the goodwill of their customers. Some existing tournament organizers don't care about selling cards or anything beyond the tournament. They're just running this tournament to make money. Channel Fireball has to care about their public image. And if they're seen to be taking advantage of this monopoly to raise GP prices across the board, they will suffer hugely for it, and I don't think they're stupid enough to do that. And the idea that now you have your choice and options of which tournament organizers and GPs you go to, that's false. Most people are lucky if they get a GP in their area once every two years. If you protest the prices at one GP, 
it's not like you get to go to another GP, you just don't go to a GP. But now with all GPs under Channel Fireball's purview, you get to say, hey, we don't like how all these GPs are being run, and we can actually enact some sort of public push and change to make sure that Channel Fireball doesn't just gouge people with this supposed monopoly they have. Fabulous points, and I certainly agree with the idea of being wary of use of the term of monopoly, and I hope I didn't say that in my opening 90 seconds. I was intentionally trying to steer clear of it. I think people are certainly misusing it, and that the only monopoly here is the one Wizards has over its own product. Yes, absolutely. I think my use of it might have actually been more in response to general community feedback than your argument directly, so my bad. Uh, I'd love to hear your additional thoughts, though. Well, it's nobody's bad, and we all want what's best for the game, and I do believe Channel Fireball wants what's best for the game. After all, their business is the game, so of course they want the game to thrive. But what about those other companies that also want what's best for the game? Channel Fireball is not the only one that wants to be the best it can be. It's not the only one that is forward-thinking. What about the company of today that wants to be running a GP tomorrow? Shouldn't they have that opportunity? Is it an unfair business advantage for you to say, no, you will never be able for your area to put in a bid to successfully wow us with this amazing GP, whether that's a company we've all heard of, like maybe Card Kingdom, or a company that is up and coming, that is dreaming of being the next channel fireball. We are a community, not just of players, but of organizations. And what opportunity have we taken from those organizations? That's a very interesting point, Professor. All right, well, Graham, you're our guest, and you get to have the last word on this really important topic. 45 seconds for your rebuttal when you're ready. You make a good point about this potentially taking the opportunity away from other smaller businesses, and I can't disagree with that. But at the end of the day, Wizards is looking to consolidate the people responsible for all the GPs and put one entity as the place where the buck stops. And when you look at how seriously Channel Fireball has taken the GPs that they've run, and in terms of coverage, often taken it more seriously than Wizards themselves, I think that Channel Fireball is a great choice to be the public face of GPs going forward. And maybe that'll change in future. So here's an honest question, Graham. How much of the uproar that was caused by this do you think is just more anti-corporatization than really looking at the facts and the issues. I think there's probably a certain amount of that. I think there's probably also the idea that magic players, and of course I myself am a magic player, like to try to find the corner case. It's the reason I hate the card stifle, because you can't just say, and of course it's an ability, meaning it can't be countered, because then someone comes in and goes, ah, but it can be countered by stifle. Right. And so I think that magic players really try to find the worst possible case for something and go, but if Channel Fireball runs all the events, then that means X. No matter how unlikely or frankly impossible X might be, it, you know, it's, uh, we, we like to bring those things up. And honestly, I think that a lot of the negative arguments I've seen brought up against this are not really going to be a big deal. Yeah. Well, that's why it's important to remember the other end of that, which is to always try and bring up the positives that can come of it. One of the things I will offer that's actually got me excited is the idea that there can be carryover prize support, meaning that if you earn tickets or points, since Channel Fireball is doing all of the events, they might be able to set up a system in play where you can build those up over a period of many GPs and then maybe redeem them for something bigger. I was always very discouraged by, if I go to a GP and grind out some side events, it's either use them or lose them. So that's definitely a positive. We all want what's best for the game. Exactly. And we've got wizards overseeing Channel Fireball. So, uh, you know, they can't get too out of control. I'm just happy that this will ideally bring a consistent quality to GPs. At least you'll know what to expect, that a GP in Vancouver is going to be run the same as a GP in Philadelphia and is the same as a GP in Bern. You know, we don't get some wild variance in just who happens to be running that GP. You know that Channel Fireball is going to be answerable to how GPs are run, and I think that is a positive. 
Well, we will we will have to wait and see. So, uh, yeah. thank you so much for joining us. Uh, for the one person viewing right now that doesn't know who you are and what you do, tell us, who are you and where can we find you? Loading Ready Run, we do comedy. A lot of it's magic related, a lot of it's video game related, a lot of it's just comedy and entertainment. Check us out on YouTube. Subscribe to our channel, youtube.com slash loadingreadyrun. Check us out on Twitch, twitch.tv slash loadingreadyrun. We stream something every day of the week. Um, we just want to make you laugh. Well, you've certainly done that over the years, and we certainly will have all of those links in the video description for people who have not somehow checked you out to check you out, and I really recommend that our viewers do. Thank you. Okay, and Nate, also, let's hear from you. Where can people find you if they want to see more of your content? Thank you so much, Professor. It was a delight to be in one of your videos, finally, as a longtime fan. And uh, if any of the viewers out there want to watch one of my videos, I produce Enter the Battlefield, a documentary series found on Magic the Gathering's YouTube channel. There's also a film, Enter the Battlefield, that you can watch on Netflix. Please give it a good rating, please. And uh, if you want to watch the old stuff, uh, we made some silly videos called Walking the Plains way back in the day. Those are still on YouTube, too. All right, well, I want to give a really big thanks to both of our guests as well as my co-host, Josh Lee Kwai. Josh, you have your own separate YouTube channel that's actually kind of exploding right now. Why don't you tell our viewers about what they might want to go check out over at The Command Zone? Yeah, you can find us at The Command Zone uh, podcast on YouTube. We do an EDH podcast every week, but we also have a new show called Game Nights, which the professor was heavily featured on just a couple episodes ago. It is our take on uh, Magic the Gathering gameplay. It's very unique. I think you would enjoy it. It's highly edited and very entertaining. And we also had uh, a new episode that just came out featuring Seattle Seahawks uh, NFL football player Cassius Marsh and Mel Lee from the, the story team from uh, Magic the Gathering formerly. And we did have Melissa DeTora with the professor, so I, you definitely want to check it out. Again, you can find that the Command Zone podcast on YouTube. I absolutely need to go check that out. I didn't realize you did an episode focusing on me. <laughs> Who else can we focus on? I, I don't know, but I really am looking forward to watching that. I wonder if I win. Uh, <laughs> I'll just have to go check that out over at the Command Zone YouTube channel. We have links for our guests' uh, uh, plugs as well as yours, Josh, down in the description. And of course, if you want to hear more from me, then you can do so right here at Talarian Community College. Or be sure to follow me on Twitter or Facebook, or maybe both. Remember to vote on who you think won the debate, just click on the I at the top of your screen to let us know who you think offered the better debate for each issue. And with that, until next time, I will see you when In Response resolves. And this program was made possible thanks to a sponsorship from Card Kingdom, as well as the Patreon support of viewers such as you. So thank you.